So most likely this is how you feel about reading API documentation. You're completely confused and overwhelmed because there's a lot going on. So hopefully by the end of this video, you will not be feeling this way anymore. So APIs and webhooks explained. This is everything that we're going to cover. So what is an API? How do APIs work? How to read API documentation? And what are webhooks and how are they different from APIs? So first up, what is an API? So let's just start off with the technical definition. An API or an application programming interface exposes a service while developers write code to consume it. So APIs are used wherever you need an answer from a particular request. And the use cases here are to create a user, to sign up a user to a newsletter, to create a payment, to access an external service. So in a nutshell, APIs are a way that we can communicate with external services. And in order to communicate with those external services, we need to be able to write some code. So why are APIs important? APIs are extremely important because without APIs, if we're using an AI automation builder like NADN, we are restricted to only native nodes and tools within NADN's infrastructure. So you can really think of it like this, where an AI agent can't access external tools or services. Now with APIs, the possibilities are endless and we're able to access external websites through HTTP requests. We're able to access different tools and services like Gmail to send and get emails like HubSpot or different types of CRM alternatives. So it really allows us to access anything as long as it has API documentation. So with APIs, the possibilities in NADN are endless, limitless. And that's really why one of the reasons why NADN is one of the best platforms to build AI agents and automations is because we can integrate with so many different third-party services and tools. Now, moving on, how do APIs work? So this is one of the best analogies to explain exactly how they work. And you can compare it to ordering some type of meal at a restaurant. So there's the customer, which is you. So you have the menu, which is the documentation that explains everything that the restaurant offers. You have the waiter that comes up to you, talks to you, takes your order and brings it back to the kitchen. The kitchen then retrieves the food that you want, gives it to the waiter and the waiter brings it to you. Now the whole point of the system is to extract complexity, right? The kitchen is very complex. There's lots of different ingredients, foods, meals that you can have. But if you just go up to the kitchen yourself, you bypass the waiter, you don't have a menu and you ask for some random food, one, they might not have it. Two, they might produce a meal that you didn't want. So it's a way to extract complexity and ensure that you get exactly what you want. Now, how does this relate to APIs? Well, this kitchen analogy is very similar to how APIs work for AI agents. So AI agents using the proper API documentation are able to retrieve data from third-party services following a similar process. These APIs act as a bridge that connects AI agents to external data and services. So first, it's really important to understand the API documentation. This is like the menu. This tells the AI agent what kind of requests it can make and what information it can expect back. So the AI agent, once equipped with that API documentation, will create an HTTP request and send it out. That request travels to an endpoint, which you can think of as the kitchen, which is basically a digital server waiting for instructions. The endpoint then processes the request, retrieves the relevant data, and sends it back as a response. And then finally, the AI agent reads that response and uses the information to perform its task. So in short, documentation guides the AI agent, which is why it's incredibly important that we know how to read API documentation and input the proper variables into the AI agent. And then the request goes out, the endpoint processes it, the data comes back, and then the agent uses the data to perform its task. So now let's talk about the components of that request node. So there are four components to an HTTP request. The first one is the URL or the endpoint. The second is the method. The third is the header and the fourth is the body, which is optional. So to break down making a request into those four pieces, so the URL, in this case, if we're searching up movies on Google, the URL would be www. 
google.com, which makes sense. And then our query parameter, which is added to the end of the URL, would be something like question mark Q equals movies. And that's basically what is happening when we search up movies on Google. These query parameters are used to filter or modify the data you request from an API. They are added to the end of the URL in the format of question mark key equals value. So for us, it's question mark Q equals movies. So Q is the query parameter with the value being movies. So next up is the method. The method describes the action to be performed at a given URL. The most common methods for HTTP requests include get and post. So get means receive information, post means send information, and then there's a few others like delete, put, patch, which are less common. And then the third component are header parameters. Some APIs require custom headers for tracking, versioning, and other purposes. Common uses for header parameters include authentication, so sending API keys or tokens. Examples of this could be authorization, bearer space token, or content type indicating the format of the data being sent. So the content type might equal application slash JSON if you're sending JSON. And then the last piece are body parameters. And the body only exists for post requests and it contains information sent to the server. So if you're using some type of form submission which takes someone's email, then the body parameter would just be a key value pair including the person's email. Now this stuff seems very complicated because there's lots of different pieces that we need to put into HTTP requests. But the beauty of it is that that we have this thing called a curl command, which in NNN, we can copy this command into HTTP request nodes, and it will auto populate all of these values for us. So if we look at this curl command for perplexity, it really has everything that we want. So the request method was post, it has the URL, and it has the custom headers. So authorization, bearer, and then your API token. It has the content type, so application slash JSON. And then it has the body parameters that we're going to be sending, which in this case is just data, which includes the model that we'll use, which is sonar, and includes the messages, which includes the system prompt, and the content of that system prompt, which is just be precise and concise, and then also the user prompt as well, with that content being how many stars are there in our galaxy. So first off, if you're curious if a third-party service has an API, what I typically do is I look up the service followed by API documentation, so perplexity API documentation, and you can see right here you have perplexity API, and this should give us all of the information for perplexity's API. And you can see that this is the curl command right here. We can browse their latest models, and we can just go right into their quick start guide by clicking start building. You can get your sonar API key, and then we can click the API API reference, and this should have everything that we want, all of the API documentation for using perplexity. So starting off at the top, we have the curl command right here. This is what we could copy paste into that HTTP request node in NADN, and it would autofill the request for us. This is the status code for what a successful completion would look like, and we're going to get into what that means. And then just reading through the API documentation, these are all the components of the API request that we need to know about. There are certain components which are required, like authorized the body parameters, the messages, so exactly what you're going to say, which this is string. It's going to have the data type for each component. It'll even have an example. So this is kind of what we saw, right? The role, this is the system prompt, the content, be precise and concise, user prompt, content, how many stars are there in our galaxy? So that's an example of the body parameter that we're sending over, which in this case is called messages. There's two types of body parameters, the model that we're going to use, and then there's also messages. And there's an example of that. And then there's all of these optional components that we can send over like search mode, reasoning effort, temperature, return images, response format, all of these different types of things that we can edit if we want to, like at the temperature, if we want the output to be more focused, deterministic, and less creative, then we'd lower the temperature. If we want it to be more random or creative, then we'd make the temperature higher. The value would be between zero and two. So for each one of these components, it gives us the data type, so if it's an integer, if it's a number, it's a string, a Boolean, um, it gives us the data type and it also gives us a few options of what the inputs should be. So for temperature, it's between zero and two. But at the very top, we have the required components that we need to have in our HTTP request in order to make a successful API call. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this curl command and we're going to go into NADN and just set this up very quickly together. So I have a workflow right here. We're going to add an HTTP request. And all I'm going to do, it's going to be super easy. I'm just going to click import 
curl command. I'm going to copy that curl command, click import, and it's going to autofill this HTTP request for us. So we'll have the method is post. It'll have the endpoint URL. It'll send these headers. So we have send headers selected. It has the proper headers. So authorization and the value is bearer and then our API token, which we need to create. And then it also has the body parameters, right? And the body parameters are in the form of JSON. And this is what we have so far, which lines up exactly with the curl command. Now, if we are building this in an AI agent, then I might sub out the content here with our own dynamic input, but we'll leave it there for now. Now, before I progress, we're gonna move back and we're gonna learn about setting up credentials. So credentials are how NADN lets applications know that you are allowed to make a given request. Most APIs require authentication through credentials. So in order to authenticate ourselves, we'll have to create a credential within NADN, which allows Perplexity to know that we are allowed to make this given request. So what you can do is you can send headers like this individually for each request in which we would use authorization, and then the value would be bearer and our API key. Or what we can do is we can go to authentication. We can click generic credit credential type. We can do header auth since we're sending headers. And then what we can do is we can create a new credential. We can name this credential perplexity. And what you'll have to do here is you'll have to follow the same exact header structure that was shown in the curl command. So this would be authorization. And then the value would be bearer space API key. And now what you'll have is you'll have your own credential set up that you can just toggle this credential and you don't even need to send headers. You don't even need to send headers anymore. You can just use this credential every single time. Now, before you even go into this trouble of copying the curl command and setting up this request manually yourself and creating your credential, first you'll want to check if there is a native node within NADN that you can just access quickly. So if I look up perplexity, there is actually a native node with an action of message a model that I can use myself. And now that you're inside of this native node, NADN basically handles a lot of the API documentation for you. So you'll be able to select the model easily in a dropdown. You'll have the user prompt and you'll be able to drag the dynamic text into there. And again, in order to create your new credential, you'll be able to do that here. And all you have to do is insert your API key right there. And, in, and to get your API key, you will want to go to perplexity.com, sign up for an account, add a few bucks for API billing, and then go to API keys and create your new key. Go ahead and name your API key, then copy that key and add it into and it in. And then click save. And that's really how you set up your own credentials and HTTP requests inside of NADN. Now shifting gears, if you look at the components of a response, there are three components to an HTTP response. The first one is the status code, the second is the header, and the third is the body. So the status code is a three digit number returned by the server in response to a client's HTTP request. So common status codes include the following, 200, which means that your request is successful. That's what we're going for. 400 means that it's a bad request indicating that the server cannot process a request because it was either corrupted, malformed, or just invalid. This is actually a client-side error, meaning that the issue stems from your device, browser, or the way you constructed the request rather than the server itself. A 401 status code means unauthorized, which means that the authentication, something is up with your authentication, which typically means that your API key is wrong. 403, forbidden. This may mean that your account doesn't have access to the data you are requesting. 404, not found. You could get this error if you type in a URL that doesn't exist, for example. And then 500, which is server error. It means that it's an error on the server side, but it's important that you understand these status codes because if you get a 500 error, that means it's an error on the server side, which means you don't want to keep putting in requests unnecessarily or make drastic changes to your workflows if it isn't even your fault, right? That could cost you tokens and could really set you back if you're changing things unnecessarily when it's not even your fault. So really important to understand understand the status codes and exactly what they mean. It's really helpful for debugging. So the second component of a response is the header. The header gives more detailed context to the request. Some common response headers may include the content length or the content type. And then the third component of a response is the body, which is the body is the actual data that's returned. It can be in different formats and it's specified in the header. It can be HTML, JSON. Now shifting gears, we're going to talk briefly about 
webhooks because webhooks are a bit different than APIs. So what is a webhook? A webhook is an HTTP callback that allows an application to send an automated real-time notification to another application when a specific event occurs, such as a new purchase or a change in data. So since we love analogies, here is another one for you. So imagine that you're waiting for someone to come to the door and you're just occasionally checking if someone's there. Every once in a while, you're just getting up, looking outside that window, seeing if anybody's there. Now, what a webhook does is it adds a doorbell to the door. So you don't have to continually check the door to see if anyone's there. You can just wait until you're notified when someone arrives and presses the doorbell. That's equivalent to a webhook. Now, the difference between webhooks and APIs is that unlike traditional APIs, which require one system to constantly pull another for information, webhooks enable a push model where data is automatically sent to a designated URL, a unique randomly generated URL only when a trigger event happens. This makes webhooks an efficient way to integrate with systems and automate workflows for real-time communication. Some other differences include APIs use authentication, while webhooks mostly don't. They also use different headers as well. So to just emphasize this point, we're going to be using a payments example here, where the first example where you're checking the door, this is called polling. So if you're curious if you got a payment from Stripe, every now and then you're going to check, you're going to poll to see if Stripe received a new payment. This is really redundant and unnecessary because you can set up a webhook, which gives a real-time automated notification whenever a payment is received. So webhooks are very useful for events such as when a new order was created, a subscription was canceled, a user was registered, or a payment was received, and you want to trigger some type of automation based on those events. That is when webhooks are typically used. So that'll be all for this video. Hopefully by the end of this video, you have a foundational understanding of both APIs, how they work, how to format HTTP requests in N8N, and webhooks and how they are different from APIs. I think this is very important before you start jumping in to building AI agents to really understand the difference between these two and understand how these work because this is really what powers a lot of N8N AI agents and automations is their ability to communicate, send, and receive data from third-party services outside of N8N and understanding API documentation and how to set up these nodes is really important for building very powerful AI systems. So if you like this video and you want to learn more about AI and building AI agents and automations in N8N, then make sure to subscribe and stay tuned for more. Really appreciate you watching till the end. Thanks.